welcome to the Data Bytes podcast. I have been looking forward to this conversation because um, you're talking on a subject that I think is just so applicable to anyone. I was first going to say in the business world, but then I'm thinking of collective intelligence. I'm like, I bet sports teams have this. Oh, like, yeah. What are we not on a team, right? Like as individuals, we are social creatures. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I think that's true more and more. So. Yeah, so I'm so excited to dive in today and talk about your research. Um, but just so the audience can get to know you a little bit more as well, what's your story? How did you end up in the position you are today? What attracted you to organizational behavior research? Well, in some ways, and sometimes I joke that it was kind of an accident because I had no idea that this field existed when I was an undergrad, but. I uh, I needed to take a an elective that met on Tuesday and Thursday morning at 8.30 because I had a very tight schedule. I was in Army ROTC and I had part-time job and everything. And I took this class called the Social Psychology of Organizations that was taught by Richard Hackman. And it completely like reoriented everything I wanted to do. I changed my major. I ended up eventually going back to graduate school and he was my advisor and and, you know, I've just been working on uh, teams ever since. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those times that, you know, a class changes everything about how you see things. Yeah, I'm always surprised at how often that has happened. I can't tell you how many guests I've interviewed and they were like, well, this was my major. And then I took this one class and I think it just goes to show like how important like your general education is and taking that diversity of classes too, because you never know what you may stumble upon and be interested in and how it may change the trajectory of your life. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, you know, as I talk to students looking at colleges and stuff, I, you know, really encourage them to just keep an open mind like that because that's absolutely true. And I hope students will continue to have the opportunity to try new things. So you have done some really amazing things in your career. Um, one, you received your doctorate from Harvard, which is incredible. Congratulations on that. You also have papers published in Science, um, National Academy of Sciences, Academy of Management Review, Organizational Science. I mean, the list could just go on and on. You're also currently the professor um, at Carnegie Mellon School of Business and then the senior editor at organization science. So given all these vast experiences, and I'm sure this is just, you know, a tip of the iceberg, right? Uh, has there been one lesson that's been really valuable in your career that you feel is just important that maybe someone else could benefit from the lesson that you've learned and all these experiences you've had? Well, I think it actually relates to a little bit what we were just talking about, which is to kind of remain curious, right? Uh, and not only about learning new things, but also about new people. Um, I, I feel like one of the, the keys to being able to collaborate with different people, to work on new problems is to not, you know, all of a sudden dismiss things, right? But to kind of get interested, even if it seems really bizarre, why would somebody do that? Or why would they want to do that? I mean, there's, there's some perspective from which it makes sense to them, you know, and so getting interested in that, right, can help you learn about, you know, a whole new thing you didn't ever think about before. Yeah, that's kind of our, I think you're in the right spot, or maybe it's like like minds come together and are attracted to each other. Because at the end of the Data Byte podcast, our little saying is, um, stay curious and keep learning. So you definitely landed on the right podcast or by well, like, the right some best. of these. Maybe you infected my subconscious. That's so funny. Okay. Yeah, maybe I should have thought of something else. To say then. Is, is that Could how be. collective intelligence works? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so, but you do research collective intelligence. I do. What can you just start off by defining for all that for all of us? Because I, I have an idea of what it is but I want to make sure we're alive before we start diving into this. Yeah, no, that's a really good question because there are a lot of people who um, I think have an idea about what it is, but maybe, um, you know, may not exactly line up with the way we look at it in our research. So, um, so we define collective intelligence as the ability of a group to work together and to solve a variety of problems. Now, and this is kind of parallel to how researchers think about individual intelligence. Because if you think about an individual, 
Uh, if somebody's really good at a particular kind of task, you think, oh, you know, she's good at math or, you know, he's good at writing. But when you see somebody do well on a variety of things, you know, that's usually what leads to the inference that they have this underlying ability uh, to perform well across a range of different environments. And so that's the same sort of approach we take to thinking about collective intelligence in, in groups or, or at human computer groups. I mean, uh, it can generalize to a variety of different collectives, if you will, um, but it's this underlying ability to adapt and perform and adjust given changing circumstances and tasks. Given that definition, it seems like anyone who either is part of a team, leads a team, has a team, is someone who would want to have collective intelligence for their team, right? I mean, this is that kind of the pull point of why we bring people together is to work on something typically to solve a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I think though, for a long time, the assumption was that uh, if you just get smart people together, the team will be intelligent. And I think what we're learning is that that can be true sometimes, but that's not automatically the case. You know, that there's another, um, you know, set of qualities uh, that seems to be helpful that isn't exactly the same as individual intelligence. So what do those qualities look like? Is it qualities that come from the individual team members? Is it qualities that come from the team leader? You know, how do we foster that collective intelligence? Um, I mean, so yes and yes and yes. I mean, <laughs> it's a variety of things. So. Um, certainly there are some qualities that the individuals have. So people who have, say, social intelligence or good collaboration skills um, definitely add a lot to the collective intelligence of teams they're on. Uh, there are also features of the combination of people. So we find that uh, cognitive style diversity uh, is uh, beneficial for collective intelligence, and so is gender diversity and ethnic diversity. So having a good combination of people with a variety of different perspectives and, and backgrounds and experiences is, is beneficial. Um, and then certainly the leader has a, a big influence, uh, can be sometimes negative uh, if it's a leader who uh, enacts their role in a way that suppresses the collective intelligence of the rest of the group. But um, if somebody who is also a good collaborator and perceptive, uh, chances are they're going to benefit the group. And then there are things about how the group is structured, uh, how, how the goals that people are pursuing and whether they're aligned, um, all of these things uh, contribute to the collective intelligence of the team as a whole. So I want to go into each one of these skills you mentioned, or traits, I should say. Mm -hmm. And first, the collaboration skill, because I think this is something that when I personally want to always be a better collaborator, <laughs> okay? And then I want to foster that in my teams, but what does collaboration look like in the day-to-day, -day, right? Is it just saying, mm -hmm. hey, happy to help? Or like, what are those signs of like, I'm well, that a can, collaborator? That can certainly be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so, um, well, first thinking about it in terms of an individual um, ability or quality. So... I mentioned um, social intelligence. We specifically have looked at a capability called social perceptiveness, which is the ability to pick up on subtle cues and to draw inferences about what others are thinking or feeling. And it's an ability that is part of the broader concept of social intelligence. Uh, the other kinds of qualities often relate to being able to manage social interactions and also uh, use those perceptions to, you know, help an interaction go, you know, more smoothly. Uh, but these skills tend to be correlated and a lot of the um, most reliable measures are measures of individual ability to pick up on cues. And so that's what we use in our research. But we do find that when you have some people in a team who have a higher level of skill in that area, then they tend to do other things that facilitate teamwork. So. Uh, for example, we also uh, have observed in, in many studies that teams with a high level of communication and more equal communication tend to be more collectively intelligent. And when you have people with higher social perceptiveness or social intelligence in the team, you tend to see more of that because those people will notice, for example, if they're doing too much talking or somebody's been very quiet or maybe somebody isn't saying anything but seems to not agree 
you know, with what uh, others are saying, et cetera. And those are the kinds of behaviors that tend to foster the qualities that are, you know, that lead to collective intelligence. One of the traits you also mentioned or uh, the things that could add to collective intelligence is the structure of the team. So uh, to me, it seems like most organizations are structured the same way. Like you typically have a board, you have a CEO, you have VPs, right? And it's uh, this whole hierarchy. Is that the structure of the team you're talking about or are there different structures that we don't know about that we could be organizing our teams better? Well, I think that um, teams can... In broader groups can take on a variety of structures and still be collectively intelligent, but it depends on how those structures sort of affect the rest of the behavior of the group. So, uh, for example, there's been a lot of debate in the literature on whether or not hierarchy is good. Mm -hmm. And they, you have these competing, you know, battling studies about it. Well, we actually did a study to look at that because we had the same question. And what we found was that Hierarchy can actually be helpful as long as, uh, you know, the leader, again, is exhibiting qualities that enhance collective in intelligence. And it's a stable hierarchy, meaning that the members are not competing with each other to be in charge. Yeah. Uh, and so, in fact, in, in one study we did uh, looking at this issue, we found that uh, in general, if we had the team elect a leader, but told them they could elect a different leader later, then the group members were kind of competing with each other. They were interrupting each other. Members perceived more conflict. Uh, and in general, it seemed to harm collective intelligence. And it, it kind of, though, an interesting twist that relates a bit to who's in the team, which I was talking about earlier. Uh, here, what we found was that all the interrupting and uh, jockeying for position was bad for collective intelligence, especially if the team was predominantly female. Mm -hmm. uh, the more members were exhibiting this competitive behavior, the more uh, disengaged um, the team members became. Um, however, in the all-male teams, they actually were more engaged and they were higher in collective intelligence. And so uh, that's the, you know, one exception that I've seen um, in our research where it seems like having maybe a little bit of a competitive atmosphere could be beneficial. Um, but for the vast majority of our studies, we usually do see a benefit to having um, women in the team and actually a majority of women uh, and ha seeing more cooperative behavior patterns such as, um, you know, more equal contribution to communication. And if a hierarchy fosters that, then a hierarchy will, will be beneficial. And if it doesn't, then it won't. So it's in our studies, it doesn't seem to matter as much exactly what the structure is, as long as the other behaviors are, are conducive. So another trait you mentioned was cognitive style diversity. There are so many ways to look at this, but I know you've done a lot of research on the effects of gender composition, and you mentioned a little bit about the competitiveness, which to me I find so interesting because it feels like at many times our world is structured in this very competitive cycle, right? So Absolutely. when we think about women in the workplace, it's like, okay, there's a lot of systems that need to be changed to make this effective. But you also mentioned how much cognitive style diversity adds to collective intelligence. So could you tell us a little bit more about some of the research you've done there? Yeah, um, we've done quite a bit of research. And in fact, um, one of my former students, who's now a professor, uh, Ashani Agarwal, and I have collaborated on a number of studies because she's been fascinated by this since the time she was a graduate student. Uh, and so we do see that um, when left to their own devices, teams that are uh, have more cognitive style diversity, if they have at least a moderate level, they tend to reach much higher levels of collective intelligence. If they have a very high level, but if they have people in the team who are good at collaborating and facilitating um, different perspectives, especially people who maybe are have more than one cognitive style that they express, which is a not you know, a large portion of the population is maybe about a quarter at most uh, based on our studies. Um, but these people actually can help even highly cognitively diverse teams be collectively intelligent. So again, it's kind of the, the combination of people that seems to really make a difference. And any advice 
then there's a lot of people that I meet, leaders who right now they know that their team isn't very cognitively diverse, right? And so they're looking to change it. But when you're part of the out crowd, it can be like, hey, I don't want to come into there because I'm going to be that minority crew. <laughs> right? Any advice for leaders who maybe they don't have a good balance within their team today, but they want to make sure that the minority group is still being heard and being valued. What can you do as a leader in that situation? Well, I think, I mean, the first thing is to realize that there is this risk, right? When you bring um, uh, members of a different, of an out group, if you will, or a, a different group into an organization, whether you're talking about gender or if you're talking about functional diversity or, you know, occupational background, uh, there is a tendency for those people to uh, both not necessarily always speak up because uh, it can be um, intimidating and there's a tendency for the others in the group maybe not to necessarily notice or get, you know, invite them into the conversation. So I think the first thing is just realizing that this is likely and it doesn't mean anyone is a bad person or not smart. You know, it's just a, a natural um, kind of pattern that we see in a lot of different situations. So getting, finding ways to get that person uh, to be able to contribute, whether it's um, either sometimes leaders try different techniques, having different people facilitate the meeting, um, having people be mentored or pair up with somebody in a meeting so that, or they come in, maybe they have gotten to review some of the topics and some of the information ahead of time so that because if they're from a different background, it may not be as familiar. And so they may need a little more time to sort of think about and process and formulate their thoughts, right? Um, so depending on what the situation is, just helping that person feel more comfortable and then really trying to find a way and opening uh, to bring in um, their perspective, even you know asking them, especially if they've had a chance to prepare, um, uh, can be really important. Uh, because we know that a lot of the reasons that uh, their expertise doesn't get used. And and also be a lot of the reason why people ultimately leave uh, is when they don't feel like they have a chance to uh, contribute or their contribution isn't being valued. Yes, and that brings up to me the a study that I believe you were part of, um, which was the effects of team composition and on the use of expertise, right? And let me know if I'm summarizing this properly, but essentially if women were in the minority group, they were less likely to speak up and participate. And even if they were the expert on that topic, and this actually just came up in a recent women in data chat, you know, there was an individual who went to a team happy hour and she mentioned, Hey, I just didn't feel like I could speak up. I was the only woman there. And yes, I know my stuff and I feel really confident in what I know, but everybody else was just exuding so much confidence. I didn't speak up and I, and I left, right? And I think so many individuals in the minority group can relate to this, but you had a really interesting finding in this study, which is if they do speak up, right, they usually have more influence on other team members and their expertise and and they actually perform better when they do. So to me, mm -hmm. that is just such a highlight of like, yes, it's scary. Yes, it's hard, but good things do happen when we do speak up. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, that was a study I did, uh, a student, a former student of mine who's also now a professor, Anna Mayo, um, was the lead author on that study. And it was, a. Uh, it again was another study where there are these different findings in the literature, you know, gee, you have these women who have expertise in these teams, but the teams don't seem to be using it, what's going on and, you know, different competing findings. And so we really wanted to pull apart this effect of participation and influence, right? And so what we found was that, because we were able to actually measure everybody's expertise on the task they were working on ahead of time. So we knew who the experts were. And when you had either men or women in the minority, but it was the effect was slightly larger when it was women, um, there would they would tend to speak less than average and definitely less than would be warranted given their expertise, right? 
But when they did speak up, uh, as you were saying, you got it exactly right. Uh, people listened because, uh, and that's been shown in some other studies too, that when you have somebody who is unique, who's different from the other group members, when they do speak up, people do tend to pay a little bit more attention and concentrate a bit more on what they're saying. And so in our study, then it did have influence and then the team performed better. And so, um, I, you know, we know from a variety of studies that women tend to underestimate their expertise or to question themselves, you know, not put themselves out there. And that's what we were seeing in this study as well. But, you know, it's to the detriment, not only to themselves, but to the, the teams they're part of. So absolutely kind of, you know, trying to quiet down those like doubting voices, uh, especially when you, when you know, you, you know, your stuff. A hundred percent. I mean, I think to me, that study is one I hope that every woman in the workplace reads just because it's, it acknowledges the feelings many of us have, which is not wanting to speak up, but it also reveals to the benefits that can come when we get the courage to do so. And so to me, if I can just shout that study from the rooftops, I feel mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. kudos to you and your former student for putting in the work and asking the good questions and separating that out. Well, those are the most fun projects we work on, I think. So, yes. So if you, as we wrap up here, do you have any advice for leaders in this space who really are looking to optimize that collective intelligence? I mean, based on all the research you've done, is there one thing that pretty much everyone can do today to start to optimize that and we'll start just first for like as a leader of a team but then also as like an individual contributor right because as mm -hmm. you mentioned from the beginning it's not just about what you know the leadership does but it's about every individual on that team yeah no that's absolutely right uh well so a lot of times when i teach about this uh to our mba students to our executive education participants it really starts with the foundation of who the people are uh, and I mentioned earlier about the importance of collaboration skills and social intelligence. And so I often explain, you know, if you're, if you have the opportunity to decide who you're going to bring onto a team and you're considering two people and one person is the world's expert in something, but uh, kind of a borderline collaborator and someone else has a high level of expertise, but maybe is not the world's expert and is a good collaborator, I go with the good collaborator, right? Because on on balance, that is probably going to, you're going to use more of their knowledge and benefit from it uh, if they have the ability to also work with the team. So just thinking about um, who you're bringing on the team, the mix of people, uh, again, if you have the opportunity to really uh, diversify in terms of, you know, the various dimensions we've talked about. And of course, that different settings will, um, you know, allow that or, or have more options than others. Um, and, and also being aware of if you can't have exactly all the team members that you would ideally bring together, what are the gaps maybe? And what are the strategies that you could um, use to try to mitigate that? So if you do need to maybe have more uh, parameters around how you hold meetings to make sure everybody gets a chance to talk and um, you know, that kind of thing, uh, just being aware of what the issues might be, you know, by virtue of who's on the team and, and how you can foster that collaboration. So that would be the first place I would, I would look as a leader. Um, can I ask one more yeah. question on for, as a leader for collaboration? How do you, is there any good tried and true interview questions or tests? to test collaboration, right? Because those are something that I think all of us in an interview would be like, yes, I'd love to collaborate. Oh, are there good psychological tests you go to or any advice in when you're that initial hiring process? Um, to yeah. Yeah. So I think actually once you're kind of attuned to it, you can pick up quite a lot about people's ability um, in an interaction. And so, uh, you know, the as I mentioned, the particular skill we test for, and there is a, a validated test, and I think there are a variety of other tests as well, and some organizations are starting to use um, these sorts of assessments in their hiring, and, and those can be good, uh, good tools to use. But certainly in, in talking with people, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it's about picking up on subtle nonverbal cues and drawing inferences. And so uh, you could build things into a conversation where uh, you know, say 
uh, you have a phone call and it seems to be kind of a private conversation, you know, does the person pick up on the fact that maybe, oh, they should step out for a minute or give you a, a minute of privacy or, you know, just whatever uh, would make sense given the interaction. But I think once you start um, seeing, uh, you know, what the different behaviors are, it's something that you pick up on pretty readily in, in everyday sorts of interactions uh, in terms of, and you start to notice even in your regular life, you know, people who, who seem to be really uh, attuned and people who are not really paying as much attention to all of the things that then um, can help facilitate collaboration. Yes, and I get that's a good skill for each of us to practice because it goes to one of your first points, which is we all need to have that social perspectiveness. So, right. So if we start paying attention to it in our daily lives, it will add to probably us as individuals how collaborative we are. Mm -hmm. And then for so that was for so as a leader, we want to hire those people and optimize for collaboration as an individual. How can I, as an individual contributor, add to that collective intelligence on the team? Well, I think there's a lot that individual team members can do. And sometimes I have people ask me, kind of assuming there's not very much they can do. But in most of our studies, in fact, there aren't necessarily formal leaders in a lot of the teams. And yet we find um, that uh, social perceptiveness and other things that the group members do is, is really uh, beneficial. And so, for example, just building more on the social perceptiveness, you know, if I can bring that into the teams that I'm on, well, I could notice if uh, we're in a meeting and we haven't heard from somebody or maybe somebody made a suggestion, but nobody really responded and maybe I could amplify that suggestion. Or, uh, you know, if I see other things going on that are hurting the collaboration, I can either, you know, make a suggestion or talk with somebody on the side. I mean, it depends on the on the issue and the situation. And that requires some social intelligence to even diagnose all of that, right? But whether uh, you would try to do it directly with team members or with talking with the team, le me the leader and making some suggestions, um, but just raising awareness of it and uh, doing all you can to encourage uh, the right, the kind of beneficial behaviors, I think is, is the best thing you can do. Love that. Well, I appreciate all of this, I think, your research is a subject that so many individuals can relate to and something that we need more of, which is individuals working together to solve problems because we have plenty of problems to solve in this world. And to solve them, it really is going to take many of us working together to make it happen. So thank you for you and your team's work on this. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, well, I, I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to work on on such an interesting problem. So, and I'm, I'm grateful for your interest in it and for sharing our information with your, your listeners. Well, before we wrap up today, we do like to go through some rapid fire questions, just to have a little bit of fun on the podcast. So uh -huh. if you're ready, we can get started with some rapid fire questions. Okay. Let's bring it. Okay. <laughs> Is there a favorite song, podcast, or book that you can't put down right now? Well, I, the No Club is my colleague Glory Weingart's new book, which talks about non-promotable tasks and organizations and how women tend to, uh, are expected to take on more. They tend to say yes to a lot of them and it uh, can impede their career. Um, and as you can imagine, I mean, I just see those all over the place now and the book is really great. Um, so that's definitely on my, on the top of my list right now. Thank you for that. I'm going to recommend, I'm going to read this and also recommend it to our book club so you definitely should it's a great book favorite place you've traveled i recently got a chance to go to jerusalem i gave a talk um uh for some colleagues in israel and took a tour um of the inner city of jerusalem and it was incredible that sounds amazing also adding that to my list <laughs> happiness is i can't think of anything that makes me happier than like kind of hanging out with either my family or friends. Like just, it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what we're doing. I mean, usually it involves eating because that seems to be, especially my family, but yeah, absolutely. And we did In the next five years, I hope to. 
I hope to do to really have an impact on the ability of women to succeed in business school academia. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're seeing more success, but um, I'm hoping to be able to just influence even in a small way. And then last question to me, curiosity is, <laughs> mm. I think it's approaching uh, any encounter with like just a, a an open mind and just the perspective that even things that seem really ridiculous make sense to somebody. <laughs> you know? And so understanding why um, is is kind of, you know, I don't know, to me, that's the fun thing about what I do for my work, really, because I feel like that's what I'm doing all the time. So I love it. Well, Nita, thank you so much again for sharing your time and research with us. Uh, I I encourage individuals to go and check out Carnegie Mellon's Master of Business Analytics program. If you enjoy, maybe Anita's one of the individuals in this program who will change your career <laughs> uh, oh, or switch you over into uh, into a research that you didn't know you had. More converts. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. Um, but in all seriousness, if people do want to learn more about your work, um, your research, what's the best way for them to get connected with you? Well, uh, go to our website uh, the, at the Tepper School. Um, I have my profile there, or my website is anitawoolley.com. Woolley with two O's, two L's, E-Y, which a lot of people leave out one of those. So, <laughs> But I'm on the Tepper site, so you can find me there. Perfect. And we'll be sure to link that in the show notes. Well, Super. thank you again. And to all of our listeners, a big thank you. Remember to stay curious. And keep learning and we'll catch you next time on the Data Bytes podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the Data Bytes podcast. If you're looking for more resources to further your data career or find your tribe, we encourage you to become a member at womenindata.org. See you on the other side.